Okay, um, hi, good afternoon everyone. Sorry, I like a little bit of interaction. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Hey, that's better. Um, my name is Peggy Oshin, um, and welcome to this afternoon's panel, which is Black Talk, Back Talk, uh, the Capabilities of Criticism. Um, so I am currently a curator at Tate. Um, I'm also an associate lecturer at Central St. Martins. You might be able to tell by my accent that I'm not from here. Um, so I'm from London, um, and I'd like to, to introduce you to our panelists this afternoon. Um, so we've got Jessica Lynn, who is a writer, arts critic um, at Arts Black. Um, and we have, actually, do we want to give a round of applause for our, our panelists? Thank you. Um, and then we have Shante Robinson, who is also a writer critic um, and a professor at um, MOU. Thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, we have Halima Taha, who is an art historian, writer, and advisor at MOU as well. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose the reason why we're here, or the main theme of this panel, is to discuss the importance of an intra-dialogue and critique within the black visual arts community. Um, so it's really about pulling together both an international and intergenerational panel of curators, writers, and critics to generate um, a rounded discussion. Um, and I suppose when I was um, initially invited to moderate this panel, um, I was thinking about how we might approach this, but I think um, Jeremiah was really helpful in framing this um, as being much more of a conversation. Um, so really thinking about it being more like a couple of friends at home and potentially you are all overhearing this, but also hopefully a part of this conversation at the end. Um, so it's, I think the way that I'd like to approach this um, is not by really asking questions, but just a couple of things that I've been thinking about recently. Um, and I suppose in the theme of talking about criticism, um, I suppose I wanted to kind of open up this conversation with asking what this criticism actually look like for all of you. So, sorry? Um, what does criticism look like to you? Yeah, um, Jessica, do you wanna kick off? Can you all hear me okay? Um, so I think that's a really thoughtful and important question. Um, and for me, I think my relationship to criticism really emerges from a relationship to black feminism. Um, I came to writing in that way, which is to say that I came to writing as a reader. And I spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which black women across time and geographies have kind of offered multiple tools to read the world through their literature. So this means that I spend a lot of time thinking about women and foremothers such as June Jordan, Michelle Cliff, um, Barbara Smith, people of that ilk who have a particular insistence on reading the world as critics and scholars certainly, but with an eye to kind of the multiple ways in which black feminist practice might allow us to kind of unpack um, oppression, yes, um, and also really celebrate the kind of ways in which black folks, black makers show up in the world diasporically. Um, and so my relationship to criticism is really grounded in that ethos. And it's one that I try to insist on as a thinker, um, as a reader, and as someone who really loves art and culture. Can you hear me? Okay, there it goes. Okay, so I'm thinking that criticism is a, a conduit between the artist and the viewer, and I think that art writers help the meaning-making process. I'm currently looking at black feminist criticism, and that started back in 1978 with Barbara Smith in her essay towards black feminist criticism. And the thing about it is, is that we're in 2019, almost 2020, and there haven't been any concrete definitions of what black criticism, black feminist criticism looks like. And so, you know, with my work, I'm working on my dissertation coming up pretty soon. And um, I want to get into black female criticism 
in the arts as opposed to in literature as it has as it has um, traditionally been done. So a lot of writers who are looking at black feminist criticism look at uh, authors like Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston. But I think those types of uh, uh, themes and uh, symbols and all that stuff can be transferred to the visual arts. Um, and I want to be able to help artists and viewers come together and, and have establish a relationship where there's meaning making and interpretation happening. So that's what I think about uh, criticism. For me, um, criticism of art, and particularly art of artists from throughout the African diasporas, has really been shaped by just the whole history, the documented history of uh, particularly American artists of African descent following first the tradition of of um, James Porter, whose um, 1943 publication, Modern Negro Art, was the first African-American art history book. And he had questioned early on about wh um, why critics were not looking at the works of uh, American artists of African descent critically uh, when there were so many exhibitions. And then later, uh, the seminal exhibition and catalog of, of Dr. David Driscoll, Two Centuries, was then continuing his work in terms of saying, well, yes, we do have a history, and we have two centuries of history. Because during the time of Porter, um, the argument by mainstream was that black people haven't been here long enough to have a history of art, therefore we cannot critique the art. So when David Driscoll's exhibition of two centuries said, well, yeah, we've been here for two centuries, uh, that also reestablished a documented history. And then, of course, the work of Dr. Samela Lewis um, was seminal in terms of not only promoting and advocating artists, but putting it in an art historical context. But also, her work was not just in terms of uh, the traditional art historical canon, but her work put it within the context of African American historical traditions and canon. Um, and then, when I wrote Collecting African American Art, Works on Paper and Canvas, which ended up being the first book to validate collecting painting, prints, and photography by American artists of African descent as viable assets and commodities in the marketplace, that they are just now, 21 years later, catching up with that consciousness. That was building upon the hard work of these scholars and other people, even including Alain Locke in terms of encouraging artists to take pride and draw upon their African ancestry. However, with regard to criticism, one of the things I think that, um, uh, that I'm finding is that this whole notion of the black aesthetic, which has always been a controversial issue, but it's always been something that's been more heavily um, emphasized for performing and literary arts. When it comes to the visual arts, the, the concept of the black aesthetic um, was never really um, propelled like um, they did, you know, promoted in the same way. And really, there isn't a one, one specific aesthetic, but I just wanted, because both of you are scholars and, and have focused in a different way on this area, to point out that, you know, um, W.E.B. Du Bois was a real advocate for the literary and, and the performing arts. He supported the visual arts, but he was very uncomfortable with some of the imagery even that was coming out of the Harlem Renaissance. And, and also, not only was there tremendous and continues to be sexism and homophobia and all of these other things that have impacted the way art is looked at and criticized or in included or excluded, but because he was so focused on the Talented Ten and what that image and what that meant, um, he was uncomfortable with some of the imagery. So there was more of a push towards literary and performing arts. Then you go to the black arts movement, and even there where Larry Neal was the main um, voice for the black arts movement, the famous wall of respect, none of the images are of any um, artists. So again, this concept of a black aesthetic, even though you have a aesthetic tradition politically over the course of time, you know, Afro-Cobra and Spiral and everything. But I think that at this point, in terms of the way I'm looking at criticism and the way I'm writing, I'm very interested in, in integrating a, um, 
a linear aesthetic pedigree historically, but without elitism, which is a big part of the art historical and cri critical world. And I think that um, the work that we all do collectively allows us to integrate not only our history, but also to contextualize it um, through experience and also the cultural references that this market has absolutely no idea about. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to draw on some of the things that you've all talked about. Um, so we talked about this idea of um, celebration, established relationships, histories, validation, um, and also this idea of inclusion and exclusion. Um, and I think those are all really important things, especially when we start to think about and consider what audiences um, take from art criticism or how they start to engage with that. Um, so I suppose in my day job, um, working at Tate, one of the key things that um, I suppose we are really trying to do is to engage young people with art. So really thinking about how we open up that conversation for them and making that much more accessible. So I think it really starts with maybe a simple question of asking somebody, what is it that you're seeing in front of you? What does it look like? How does it make you feel? Um, so I suppose I'm really interested to hear from all of you um, because we've talked about this idea of the artist and of course the art artist is hugely important. But I think it's also really important to remember that um, as black people, arts are such an ingrained part of our everyday lives. Um, for a lot of people, they don't know that they're maybe even participating in the arts or that they are making art um, because of the way in which art is being framed as being so high culture, um, but also failing to remember that they are making culture, they are cultural producers, makers, um, curators, critters, um, critics and writers in the making. So kind of, I suppose for all of you, how do you, um, maybe approach engaging maybe what's considered as the lay person in arts criticism? Um, I actually was a docent at the High Museum for two years and I gave a tour um, in DC. So I think that just going, like partnering with, I partnered with a meetup group to give a tour of the, of the Smithsonian for um, Black History Month, so that was something I did, and I, you know that's something that I look forward to doing again. So that's one thing. But I think that also in writing for publications, it's necessary to not, you know, not always write in a way that is above everybody's head, but really speak to your audience and know who you're writing for. Um, and making that accessible, I think that there's so many tools that we have at our, at our capacity. There's podcasting, videos, there's all of these things that, you, that don't require too much funds in order to create some entertaining and some really relevant um, content. So um, I'm personally interested in developing some video projects to, um, to engage the audience. I feel like there's, I feel, especially in the black community, I feel that you know, so many people are so talented, um, but there's, you know, not always enough audience there. And I think that as writers, as artists, we need to start cultivating audiences and, and teaching them about visual literacy and, and things like that so that they feel comfortable. I, I know a lot of people probably don't feel comfortable in the museum and, you know, the way the museum is shaped, you know, the white walls, big, you know, all of that, like, don't touch anything. It's, you know, it's intimidating for a lot of people. So I think that as writers, as critics, as artists, as, you know, lovers of art, it's, we have to introduce them to that. Like, in my family, I try to, with my little cousins, I try to introduce them to art, buy them books about art, you know, do, do stuff like that to get them started early, take them to the museum. So I think there's a lot we can do to cultivate a, 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 a wider audience. Um, I think, I think I want to push back on this notion a little bit, if I can, friendly, um, and kind of acknowledge and say that, one, there are multiple ways in which black folks have been producing knowledge, knowledges outside of kind of quote unquote mainstream or primarily white institutions, right? And so I say that to say that I think as a writer and as someone who kind of came to criticism as a genre, I was very aware that there was already kind of a, a multiple lineages of what that looked like, right? Um, and those lineages might not immediately be le legible to kind of like folks outside of the community. But I think the question of audience is important 
enough to say that like our audience is we are already here, right? We have already been thinking about cultural production. We've already been talking to one another about it and kind of trying to make sense of it. I think in ways that might not necessarily be read as sophisticated to a mainstream market. And so for me, and kind of through the words of Arts That Black and through an individual practice, I'm interested in like, well, how do I excavate what's already here, right? Like how do I kind of dance in like in between these liminal spaces because like, I already know black folks are smart. We're already talking about all of the kind of ways in which culture shows up around us as you said in you know, the question. So the, I struggle sometimes with this idea that like, it's the immediate job of the critic to like, do something of introducing. Certainly we can kind of create space um, or new entry points for how a work is read. But like we talk, black folks, are, we're always talking and we're always world making and we're always making sense of how we're interacting with these kind of multiple um, visual spaces. And I kind of want to be insistent in my practice as a writer that like that is true. And because I know that to be true, what are the new questions that I can ask? Like what can I already take for granted, right? Um, and so the, the, the language around how we talk about audience and layperson is something that I feel we have to be really mindful of. Um, you know, like there are people who may not necessarily be working at museums or they may not necessarily be working or reading the New York Times every day, but it doesn't mean that they aren't already kind of in a conversation about the cultural production that they make, that they interact with, or that surprises them or they have questions about, you know. Yeah, um, I think that's great. I think um, I'm going to come back to that idea of language later on, but um, Halim, I'm going to let you come in on that. I, I think I, it, when it comes to art criticism, I, I kind of deconstruct it a bit. I think about art, and there are certain um, people in different parts of Africa and all over the world where there isn't even a word in their language called art, because art in and of itself was also a part of life. And that's a real difference in the history of art criticism anyway, which comes from a totally Eurocentric perspective. And when they have historically looked at art, art was for art's sake. It was something that only the very affluent could afford to do. And um, the uh, criticism, criticism part of that revolves around having the leisure time to have discourses to critique the art um, when it comes to the historic criticism of works by artists um, from throughout the African diaspora, um, the justification to enslave people from Africa was that they were subhuman, unintelligent, good for breeding and labor. Therefore, how could these people create I visual art, which is fundamentally about ideas and its visual history? And so back to going into museums and institutions, you know, these are um, places for historical materialism. And I think for everyday people, we have to remember that we are human, we have an intellect, emotion, and a soul, and we are valuable. And these are inanimate objects that represent the ideas, hopes, and dreams, and the values of a culture or people, whatever, wherever they're from in the museum, but that if we remember our own humanity and what we're experiencing and thinking experientially, and we know that in terms of critique, we critique ourselves every day. You, you know, you get up, you take a shower, you get dressed, you look in the mirror, you decide whether you, I decide what head wrap I'm going to wear or what earrings or what, you know, we all figure this stuff out on a very basic level so that I don't think people should feel that it's, this is, apart from you. It's, we, you know, we, all of the things that we see, we have an opinion about. And, um, and whether it's strong or weak, or whether we like it or we don't like it. But we also try to make connections as women, as, as daughters, as mothers. I mean, you know, I can't make a connection as a father or a son or a man, but I make connections based on my personal experience as a human being. and, and, and um, and really um, a human being having a spiritual experience, which means that I have to pay attention sensorily to what's happening. So I think that when you go into institutions, uh, into museums, um, that many years people were not allowed to be in unless they were the guard. I remember in 1986 I was in London and I went to the Tate. And I was actually really excited to see Salvador Dali's 
timepiece. I'd seen it my whole life in books, but I was shocked it was so tiny. But there was a security guard there, and I don't know, I think, I don't, he was from some Caribbean island. I said, well, are there any black artists here? And he said, that black people don't make art. So now you have to also look at post-colonial conditioned responses to value uh, beauty and whether, you know, uh, you, sh you should be making anything that's worthwhile. And I think that that's why it's important that we remember that as human beings, we are worthwhile. And what the cultural production is, is worthwhile, but it's historically come from a cultural production of ritual and faith and, and religious practice, and that um, the practices of visual artists for them um, have individual meaning for them that is either intellectual, spiritual, physical, whatever it is, and that if we start to deconstruct and look at the work from throughout the African dias diaspora historically in terms of gender, um, uh, the nuances of the African diaspora because there are distinct cultures and languages and, and, and everything, I think that it allows us to universalize the particular and not feel so uncomfortable or afraid, but to realize that the, there's this uh, endless wellspring that starts within us to then be able to have the exchange that you're talking about with one another in our wonderful dialogues and embrace of ourselves and one another. Thank you. Um, so as you were speaking, one of the things that um, I kind of really liked was that framing of talking about us as women, as daughters, as mothers, um, and the fact that critique can sometimes happen at home um, in kind of the everyday small decisions. Um, and I'm really, I think one of the things that I'm wondering or I've also been thinking about is where does critique happen? Um, because again, I think we all have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and I think very often, I think maybe sometimes especially as, um, of minority groups we can occasionally feel really cagey about giving that criticism or that critique of one another's practice um, because in a way it can feel like oh um, if we critique ourselves in public then that gives maybe kind of a dominant white culture the opportunity to jump in and say well they think that you're awful um, so we can we're also justified in saying that this is not great work either. Um, so I'm really wondering, where are those spaces that we can, I suppose, really openly critique the work that we're doing? Because without the critique, we can't push the culture further. We can't push our practice further, whether that be as um, writers, curators, or artists. Um, where is that space? And how, I suppose, how can we make that much more, much more open and visible? for those people who need it, because I think that's also something that we need to think about as well, that a space to critique one another is absolutely needed. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, I feel like, I think critique, criti criticizing or criticism doesn't need to be so overtly negative or positive. I'm in the mindset of, assessing and um, interpreting and ma making meaning. So I feel like if it's possible to do those things, then a reader or whoever can judge for themselves whether or not it's valuable art. Um, so I think, of, I think of myself as an art writer instead of an art critic. So I'm thinking that if those things happen, if there's something happening in the work, then it's it's obvious on its own that it's valuable. Um, I I shy away from ever saying that this is bad or this is terrible. I do, I, or I love something or something like that. Um, I don't, I don't, um, I try not to pass judgment. But um, as far as spaces go, I feel like space there there are. Spaces spaces for this. Um, I was writing for Black Art in America for about a year now and um, I was able to say whatever I wanted to say about the artists that I wrote about, about the, the culture and about, you know, um, just about art in general. So I felt that that was a safe space and I got a lot of uh, uh, support from the community. Um, people would um, 
forward the message or post the things on Facebook. So it felt like, okay, there's a, there's space and there's people who, are, who want this type of information. Um, there's also Sugarcane Magazine. I just pr pr uh, published a piece there um, about Tracy Morell, whose work is in the uh, Zucat Gallery uh, exhibit, Little Plugs. Um, but yeah, I feel that there's spaces. I feel like there can be more spaces specifically for black artists. Um, but I do feel there are spaces where we can we can go and, and talk about the art in a critical way, but not necessarily being negative or positive. I you know I, if you love something or but I feel like in writing um, also you in writing criticism you also learn that there are certain artists that you are more likely to who are more likely to bounce back after harsh criticism. Um, so like a new artist, I would never like say negative things about them because they're so new, but, but being critical about them is a different thing than being positive or, or largely negative. You know, I think the question of where does criticism go is deeply connected to the conversations we should be having about the market um, of publishing, right? And what's so special about invoking Barbara Smith and Dr. Samela Lewis as foremothers is that both of those women were very attentive to not only the politics of writing um, about black artists, black makers, but also like what then does it mean f to take that into a public arena, right? So Barbara Smith is like very invested in crit criticism that looks specifically at black lesbian literature, right? Dr. Samela Lewis is like, I'm going to create the International Review of African American Art because there needs to be a physical place for these conversations to land. And I think the reality is the expectations we have around critics who ask questions about what is working and what is not working is that sometimes we don't want to ask those questions in public or sometimes the machine of media and arts publishing wants those questions to look a certain way, right? So if you are a critic who is working with kind of mainstream magazines, you may encounter editors, often who are not black, who have a certain expectation about what it means to ask the question of what works and what doesn't work in public. And that expectation is very different than if you may have a black editor or an editor of color who is kind of interested in the nuance of debate, right? Who's not necessarily going to want you to spoon feed things. Um, and I think that, that that dance is hard because you, you want to like love on your people. But I also think a critic has to pay attention to like what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes things don't work. And so, yeah, it's certainly not a, this is terrible, this is not. But I think it is a matter of like, how can we kind of like slowly and thoughtfully and deliberately unpack the dimensions of an object, a performance, a text in front of us. And like where that live is connected to the opportunities for publishing most, like quite frankly, you know, like where it lives is connected to how folks come in contact with people who will say, I think the way you ask questions in public is important. Um, that's a market conversation because, you know, media is dying in a post-recession world. Um, the jobs are not necessarily there. The pay is not necessarily there. And then if you are someone who is fortunate enough to kind of like find yourselves a part of that community, and I am very transparent in when I say it, which I know myself to be someone at this point, right, in that conversation, that negotiation is tense because you don't necessarily want to lose the opportunities that you feel like you've rightfully earned and deserved. Um, but I think the expectation about how it shows up in the world is connected to a kind of financial conversation too. Um, and how we say what we say in public yes. or in what we feel to be risk worthy or not. Um, that's, a, that's a market conversation for me too. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of things here to <laughs> unpack. Um, but so many things just come, uh, come to mind. Um, I think that uh, in terms of uh, market and working with different publications, uh, whether they are black-owned publications that are supporting and advocating the best of culture at large, um, or they are mainstream publications and, they're, and they, are, um, they don't have a vested interest um, or they have a very specific or narrow perspective or focus. Um, I, I, I think that context and content and um, 
historic reference is extremely important in the way that we can create, how we can define the writing for publications that are not particularly interested in the work in general, except for that there's a market flurry about artists of African descent right now. But they don't really, they want to um, put a triangle in a circle, basically, in terms of how they want it described. And, um, and I feel very comfortable in pushing back and explaining that um, a, a, a Western mindset has always been infinitely more limited than any Eastern mindset or any, uh, be, because, um, and even the language is very limited. Like, you know, something like Arabic, for instance, there's a word for a glass that's half full of water, a different word for a glass that's full of water, a word for a glass that's empty, but it's still a glass. And I think that we have a great opportunity to create our own language or parameters for how we describe and discuss the artists. And I bring, and this is really important because there's an artist who is represented by a gallery who is doing extremely well with that artist's work, but they do not know how to talk about her work, you know, um, you know, or the use of hair in her work and what that means in the black, the his, you know, the black histor historical canon of hair in the black community, what that means. And they don't know how to talk about, um, the context for her work, but they're selling the work, but they're misrepresenting that artist. Um, so, you know, I feel that as an arts writer and also critically writing about the work, one of our responsibilities is really digging deep into our language and we're defining it, which is also leading by example to teach them and to show them that they have to dig deeper than all of this art speak, which I can't stand. I can't stand the um, elitism of the art world. I personally have coined it cerebral masturbation. It doesn't say anything. It's, it, you know, and, and, and it's not speaking to anything. Um, at the same time, I had an experience where I, um, I wrote an article in Sugarcane. It's, uh, the current issue has one on Bisa um, Butler. And in the course of doing some research, there were 30 articles written about her, not necessarily by people at any brown or black people. And they were, it, there were 30 different ways of saying the same story. So we have another issue here where people are just looking at what's on the internet. And if they had, if they had dug deep, they would have really understand, understood that her history going to Howard University and what Howard University meant to the development of the African-American art aesthetic um, and, um, and being led by you know, Jeff Donaldson and the whole Afrocobra you know, aesthetic and um, the Kool-Aid colors and then you know, what her story is, to really then dig deep to talk about why these things have the symbolism and color and form. You know, it's not, it's not as literal as a lot of these other publications want us to write about the work because they're thinking in a very linear, convergent way. But I think as writers, we have to think like artists do, using a divergent thought process where we're looking at the endless possibilities of what the artist may or may not be saying. But I do agree that, um, like I would never, um, when I speak to artists privately, um, I may, I will talk to them about the work because I just care about them. And I feel like I should be that family member best friend to say, hey, you've got eyeliner on your cheek, or you know, you know or hey, fix this. Um, and just talk about the work, about, well, you know, I really like this element here, but I don't feel that it's resolved, and this is the way I feel. What's happening with you? And we can have the conversation. But in the piece, I would probably focus on the stronger pieces, but then I can make reference to things that that artist is continuing to develop, and in that place provide the criticism. Because I do feel protective. I feel that a lot of the artists are more vulnerable now um, than ever because of the way the market has really um, identified their new commodity. And I'm going to fairs all over the world in part of research for the next book that I'm working on, and I'm seeing artists who are doing great at auction, but the paintings, some of them are still wet and they're coming to these fairs. Or you're seeing white spaces
uh, because the artist hasn't had time to stand back and look at it over a period of weeks or days. And so what is that doing to the market? That's showing, that's creating an uneven body of work. But what's really happening um, for some artists is that their proliferation is so great and the demand is so great that um, they're either being locked into a specific aesthetic, which is counterintuitive to, intuitive to being an artist. You're constantly evolving and growing, but the marketplace is also beginning to shape and limit what we can or should be looking to critique based on a very limited view of what the culture can produce. And we know that's infinite. But I, I you know, so I'm, I'm really concerned because some of the younger artists that are being picked up, um, that passion for the work, they're now on an assembly line because now they've got collectors who um, are waiting for work to be produced. So when do they get to explore new mediums and ideas? So I think when we're interacting with artists, it's really helpful to them as collectors, as students, as art enthusiasts, you know, as writers and, and art professionals to talk to them about how they're doing, what are they thinking about, and how is that relating to their practice today, and how do they envision themselves in the future, not just in terms of the business, but I feel like our role, and it's always like this, always like this, we are always wearing 72 hats. It's always like that. And I don't mind, you know, I'm tired, but, <laughs> but, but I think that that's the thing that we have to do as a way of preserving and nurturing and cultivating the culture because we have to support, we have to push, we have to be critical, and we also have to often defend um, the, their right for their um, work to be represented a certain way. So we don't have the same luxury that other art critics have to just say, well, yes, I go and I look at work and I critique and I write about it. And um, We don't have that. We're wearing a lot of different hats. So we, bo we bounce between art writer and art critic and historian and griot and advocate and, you know, and rep and, you know. <laughs> but I think that that's one of the beautiful things about our culture is that we do that and we come from that tradition and we've had to maintain that tradition um, and I think we should continue and, and at this time the one thing I'm sure you I hate this whole thing you know black art in their moment you know this is the whole the moniker you know they're having their moment well no you just woke up for that moment you know this the, this this moment has been thousands of years so, you know, and there's pushback if we say that because they don't, the mainstream does not, is not taking the time because they think it's a moment. Yeah, I mean, I think that in this, the question about like the urgency around the existence of critics who are black and of other color as well is really important, right? Because not only do we do something in real time for, Emerging artists, even though I hate that word so much, and it means nothing and everything. It's but a we, market term. It's a market term, right? But there's also a real way in which black critics can be invested in processes of excavation, right? Because we know that there have been multiple timelines, and we know that there have been multiple existences. And so what does it mean then to say, that I'm not only interested in responding to kind of like artists as they develop real time, but I also am really interested in kind of like unveiling work that has already been here and kind of putting a framework around practices that have already been in place for decades. Right? Like that is, I think, equally as important and for me kind of connected to what you're talking about. Like we, we have to do the kind of double dutch of like being in real time and also kind of like reminding and reaffirming and like unveiling things that have already been here. I just, I just want to say that what you're talking about, I learned when I was 12 years old, when my mother took me to the first National Black Feminist Conference specifically to hear Barbara Smith, Shirley Chisholm, mm -hmm. Eleanor Holmes Norton, and Florence Kennedy speak. And this is exactly what all of these women were talking about. And, it is, um, and there have been some wonderful men in the world that have done some great things, but it's usually been the women who are looking at the layers, like you know, you know, unpeeling layers of this onion, so to speak, and, um, and that have to uh, look at things from many different perspectives uh, in order for the, f 
complete story to be told because um, we're constantly having to deal with you know, patriarchal views um, of everything and Eurocentric views of everything. Um, so I agree with what, you know, I agree completely <laughs> with what you're saying. Thank you. Um, so we're close to time, um, but I suppose the one last thing that I would like to ask you, um, because I think we've had a really wonderful discussion um, about the importance of markets, the importance of language, and looking back at our history, and also thinking about the care of an artist, um, as you said, because I think that's a really important thing, just to ask an artist how they're doing, um, and kind of how that relates back to the work that they're creating, because I think very often people don't care about that, as you, you've all talked about, it's now very much like an assembly line, um, but I suppose in thinking about this idea of pushing practice forward, um, and also being critical, um, not necessarily overly positive or overly negative, um, but this idea of self-criticality. Um, just very quickly from you all each, how do you go about, or how will you continue to push your own individual practice forward, going forward? And I think, yeah. And then we'll open up to questions from the audience. So how do we push our own individual yeah. writing? You know, it's, I really love that, like, Barbara Smith's name is being said so much, because <laughs> she is, Many black women are important to me, but I think she has, that text toward a black feminist criticism has become, become so seminal in the past few years of my work because what Smith is calling for is like an insistence on intimacy, right? And to kind of like complicate how close we can become to an artist. And the idea of embedding oneself in, as a critic within an artist's practice is kind of controversial, right? Like we've been taught that like distance, distance, distance. Um, and I think that there's room for that argument to live, but what feels so special about Smith, what, 40 years, 41 years after she's written that essay, is that Smith is like very much, no, like I'm interested in getting close, like very close, because like I want these things on record, right? Like they deserve to be complicatedly engaged with. Um, and I think for me, the, the notion of like, becoming embedded is what's kind of keeping me writing and writing differently and kind of writing against a pace of a media and publishing world that's like I need this two days after you see the show I need this one hour after you leave the studio like you can't do the close work um, moving that quickly and it's unfortunate because that means so many talented writers don't have the funds quite literally to kind of like offer themselves up in this way. But I think Smith is such a great North Star. And I think that essay, if you haven't read it, though there are, it's so much that we can talk about and how that essay has maybe aged over time, I think that it remains really important to think about the role of black critics, right? Like we can get close and we can do some of the like unveiling and the unpacking um, that others just don't have the eyes to do. Thank you. So um, I, I try to challenge myself by writing for different publications as much as possible. And I forgot to say that I also wrote for Arts Black, Arts mm -hmm. Not Black. Thanks, girl. And that's another, that's another place where black, black scholarship is welcome. Um, but yeah, right now I'm wanting to write more for academic journals because I don't, like doing research is so daunting because it's just not enough done. And, I feel like I can contribute a voice and I welcome, oh, hello, oh sorry. So I'm, I'm thinking about writing for academic journals more often because there's really, doing research on artists and on art terms like Afrofemcentrism, like there's so, there's not enough, it's not enough done and, I've, and I'm hoping that other people will start to write. So we have conversations with each other back and forth. That's like, you know, my dream. So. Um, yeah, so I'd like to do more of that. Um, there aren't many journals out there that, you know, are created for us and for our art, and I'd like to see more of that as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I'm challenging myself to just write for different publications. Thank you. My um, writing practice is constantly evolving. Um, uh, well, you know, I've worked, you know, I've written articles for magazines and, and include and other articles for books and things. And what's happening with um, my writing now is that it's, right now I'm working on another book, but I'm also 
um, simultaneously working on different articles. Now there, there are some artists that I have interviewed and I am still working on some of their articles and it may, it's even maybe a year because I am, for certain artists that I think are really extraordinary, um, I'm, I am re I'm thinking very critically about how I want to present them. And I also want to pay attention to how they're being presented. And I'm able to critically look at what's been presented about them to see where the gaps are. So sometimes for writing for certain artists, I take a lot of time. Because I know that when I'm going to finish it, I want to really hit it for them, for their benefit. Um, there are other situations where you know, you're hired for things to, get, you know, to make money, to pay your bills, and that's real. And um, in that instance, you know, those pieces you still are very thoughtful about, but it's, it's not requiring the same kind of reflection. And, um, and for those longer pieces that are taking a longer time to do, I'm really trying to contextualize those people in a universal way in terms of art history or what have you. But it's a, my practice is constantly evolving, um, and I keep learning in the practice too. So, and I just want to um, say that uh, this is a really good opportunity right now to thank the artists that are here. Yes. And you know, I would really love if you would just quickly stand up and we could just applaud you and thank you for being the visual conscience of the time in which we live. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists. I think you've been really generous um, in sharing your practice, your thoughts, your feelings um, around um, criticism within the community. Um, and I say that very broadly. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to the audience as well for being here and part of the conversation. Um, I don't think we have time. We've got, okay, we've got a couple of minutes for some questions from the audience. Do we have any questions at all? Ah, one at the front. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anissa. I'm a student from Wheaton College. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for being present um, and just speaking from your personal truths. Um, my question is, how do you think queer politics can restructure these Eurocentric dominating discourses that surround black art and like its marketing? I'm so queer. How do how do you think queer politics can restructure these Eurocentric, dominating discourses surrounding Black art and its marketing? I mean, I think for me that is the reason I'm so insistent on kind of a consistent rereading of Smith because I think that essay is a manuscript and a manual for kind of queer politics showing up within the work, right? Like when Smith calls for intimacy and like a closeness that is still critical, like that is a way of for me kind of like enacting on that very thing. You know, like she's very clear. In 1978, literary criticism is failing black lesbian writers, right? And so therefore, this other thing has to exist in the world. This thing that distance hasn't allowed for, right? Um, and that, that closeness, that like, that draw, like that's a queer politic for me. Um, which isn't to say that it's flawless or perfect, but within the context of criticism, as we talk about it kind of like in mainstream and broad discourse, you're not, you're not, it's frowned upon to get that close, right? It, it's not a thing that is welcomed. And I think kind of like what queer histories show us is that you have to be close and in the work um, to kind of produce the radical shifts and like the paradigm moments that we need. And so I, I'm gonna offer that again as my answer, right? Like I think Barbara Smith has given us a whole lot of good things to like sit with and meditate on. Um, and we love her, she's important. Okay, we've got one question here. Thank you. This question is for the moderator from the Tate. How is the Tate, uh, you've been doing some incredible shows most recently, Soul of a Nation. Uh, how is the Tate uh, planning to engage young audiences right now, whether it be social media, whether it be um, you know, having events at the Tate? Can you share those uh, initiatives with us? <laughs> 
Thank you very much for your question. Um, so I'm actually new in post um, at Tate, um, so as curator of the Young People's Programme there. Um, and an example of doing that is just uh, last week Sunday, we had a takeover of the Ellison exhibition. Um, and that was an after hours event. Um, so we welcomed 1,500 young people into the building. Um, and we had a range of activations across all floors. Um, and it was really about shifting the focus of the conversation around climate change. Um, so we invited um, lots of artists of color, non-binary artists, to occupy that space and shift the focus of that. Because I think um, for everyone, the conversation previously around climate change has been very Eurocentric um, and not really looking at the people who are actually affected by climate change. Um, so I think it was really amazing to see all those young people occupying the space on that um, evening, um, especially as they have been really pushing that um, conversation and the agenda around climate change. Um, so those are some of the things that we do, um, I suppose, in our program. Other things that we do is we have our Take Collective um, producers, who are a group of young people between the ages of 16 to 25. Um, so they're a regular group of them who meet to support programming. Um, they're bringing their ideas, things that are really important to them, um, as well as using the collection as a really critical starting point for having those conversations about what's important in the world and what's happening right now. So that's kind of a very brief overview. Um, I won't hog the space talking about Tate, um, but yes. Um, do we have time for any more questions? No, we don't, unfortunately. But if you would like to continue the conversation, um, the panelists will be available outside, um, just in this area here. Once again, um, can we have a round of applause? Um, thank you to you and thank you to the panelists. Um, and also thank you to PRISM for putting together this wonderful fair. I think it's been absolutely amazing. Can we just have another round of applause for, uh, for PRISM? Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.